people want to really know what's behind their product. If you're offering this seamless way to buy a product, people will buy. What are the steps that I have to take as a user to be on the metaverse? There won't be a day when we, when we awake in the morning and say, oh no, we arrived in the metaverse. Performance marketing is becoming more and more difficult. Who needs something like this? Hi everyone, welcome to our interview series powered by eCommerce Berlin Expo. My name is Efe Ajunas and today I have a very exciting guest from Meta and we're going to touch upon a couple of topics involving online marketing, fashion platforms and the metaverse. Enjoy. Today I'm delighted to welcome Michael Peach from Meta. He's head of fashion platforms. Michael, it's great to have you here. Welcome. Thank you for having me. Um, so Michael, I, maybe let's get started by a little introduction. Would you like to introduce yourself? Of course, I'm Michael. Um, I'm working for Meta, previously known as Facebook, for more than seven years. And as the head of fashion platforms, I'm working with my team, supporting all the uh, DACH-based fashion platform, fashion pure play companies to work on our platform to make uh, um, the advertising on our platform as efficient as possible. All right. And uh, what have you done before you took up, took up this responsibility at Meta? You've also had several other roles, I believe. Yes, I do. I, I started my career in an agency, in an advertising agency. Then, yeah. then I, I jumped into the telecommunication industry. I built the e-com part of e plus so now it's part of the um, Telefonica company um, from scratch. And uh, then I had a um, period of five years at uh, the affiliate marketing. I think all of these things will be very, very useful during our conversation today. So um, talking about fashion platforms, um, Maybe you can tell us a little bit about what are the current topics that you guys are dealing with at Meta. I, I think that would be a good starting point. You can imagine um, all the fashion platforms are challenged at the moment, um, not only in, in, in EMEA, but also globally um, challenged by the macroeconomic challenges, um, inflation. Um, there's, there's pressure from the demand side. Um, the, the supply chain, uh, chains have to re-establish after the long COVID break. Um, and from a marketing perspective, we have a couple of challenges uh, we need to solve together with our advertisers. Um, first of all, um, there is uh, this evolving ads ecosystem. So um, we are heading in a, in a cookie into a cookie-less future. So, and, uh, what we need to find is a way how to balance privacy and personalization uh, at the same time. Um, would it be safe to say that you guys kind of took a hit with the iOS 14 update, whereby tracking got a little bit difficult and we hear from all kinds of directions that um, yeah, advertising on the Meta platform has gotten a bit more difficult? I wouldn't say um, it has gotten a bit more difficult it has uh, gotten different <laughs> so and uh, what uh, and the topic is larger the topic is larger than than iOS 14 um, so we we need to prepare ourselves for for a time where we we do not can rely on cookies anymore um, we have challenges on the mobile side for sure um, and these are uh, I would say to trigger points that uh, um, let the industry think about ways how to invent the way how we are doing online marketing. So, and, and yeah. this this means it, it is such an such an amazing time because uh, imagine the the cookie was invented twenty years, thirty years ago. So it's a it's a small kind of technology, and now we have the chance to to define new ways how to um, measure success on the internet, how to make sure that we will be able to um, deliver personalized advertising in a privacy safe way. And, uh, and this is what we are working on with our clients. And uh, we, we did a lot of progress on this. 
Um, I've also seen that you often talk about this topic as well. Do you, do you have maybe one or two indications for merchants um, what they should be prepared to um, find out more, inform themselves about? I mean, everyone is talking about a cookie-less future, right? But what does it actually mean for merchants? Yeah, I mean, um, when I look into, into our advertiser base, we, we see uh, three different groups of, of uh, advertisers. They are these advanced advertisers who are driving us, who are pushing us to deliver um, APIs to make sure we, we enable server-to-server -server integrations, um, not only for web, but also for apps. Yeah. And uh, then we have uh, another group of advertisers who are thinking, well, this might be a challenge. Um, we are not quite sure how to react on this. And then there's the third group of people um, who say, this will go away. So, <laughs> and, and they hope, they do hope this will go away and we all know hope is never a good strategy. Okay, that, that, that sounds interesting. And uh, when I think about fashion, I also think about um, all these platforms. You mentioned it, like there's the inflation, there's the consumer behavior, which is rapidly changing, actually. And since 2020, we've seen massive waves of um, people moving into the digital channel, uh, buying goods online way more than they've used, uh, they used to. Um, of course, this also meant that many e-commerce businesses profited from this um, shift right but then again after that 2022 you see like the inflation crisis um, and the war in ukraine and all these things this also has a certain impact on supply chains and all of these things combined have a significant impact on retailers and um all that what, what would you say is the biggest challenge for uh, the retailers you work with right now so that they're the number one apart from the cookie apart from these um other issues that they're dealing with online um because one of the biggest issues that th that has been discussed this year is also performance marketing is becoming more and more difficult keywords are being more expensive so how do you see all the development of these things? And as a matter of fact, um, recently in one of the events that I've attended, it was like how to hijack into offline feeds so that you end up in the feeds of offline, like let's have a billboard or something so that you can hijack into the offline feeds, like people taking a selfie and then posting that on their Instagram feed. Uh, that is more profitable than paying for the offline ad is more um, profitable at the end of the day than uh, paying for performance marketing. Do, how do you see these changes? We, as you said, we, we are living in a, in a time of changes and uh, um, someone, some uh, people can, can be afraid of change, but um, others are uh, embracing the change. And this is what, what most of our advertisers are doing. So um, this is an efficiency game. Our clients are now aiming for profitability, for efficiency. And this means um, we need to, to find completely new ways how to drive business. Yeah. So because what, what was true in the past won't be true in the future. So um, iOS changed a lot. Um, cookie deprecation will change a lot. The, the entire ecosystem is changing. We, we, we have uh, a new um, kind of marketing channel called influencer marketing. We have retail media as part of the of the entire ecosystem and now um, our advertisers need to find a way to become or to define the most efficient way to drive their own business my impression um, talking to some of the business experts in the last months is that user generated content is booming right now so many companies have, have even gone the path that they employed a couple more resources just to focus on influence influencer marketing having briefs and so that even ranging from micro influencers to macro influencers so that they land in the organic feeds of people um, engaging with uh, instagram reels uh, TikTok, and so on and so forth um, so that the content comes across authentic in an authentic way uh, how do you see the development of user generated content I'm not really surprised by this development. Uh, as you mentioned, I'm coming from the from the affiliate marketing, and one of the the strongest segment in affiliate marketing was um, this content piece. So, and uh, um, this is this is, I would say, 
the next era of affiliate marketing that people who um, tried a product will recommend this product. And with this kind of authenticity, we, we see and we have a lot of numbers uh, um, around the world that uh, um, with this more authentic content, people are easier, easier to convince um, to buy a product. Yeah. So this is not just marketing speech from, from the company who is offering a product. This is a recommendation from, from others, from people I like, from people I follow, from, from people I trust. In a way, this is also not a surprise because we come from a world that evolved into, first and foremost, product reviews. You took the time to read what other people are saying. And then uh, there came this wave that you weren't sure, okay, 50% of all reviews on Amazon are fake. Is that really the case? And then nowadays, I feel like no one is really going to their uh, grandmother anymore and ask for which washing powder should I be using? And you, instead, you go to your favorite favorite uh, in influencer and take a look at what they're using, which which one uh, one is uh, most sustainable and so on and so forth, because your and grandma we, doesn't know that. And we, we see, we see um, a change in the shopping behavior. Um, we can observe that uh, customer journeys become shorter, shorter than, than ever before. People um, are more likely to spend money on, on a social media platform if they are already in contact with an, with an um, person who is offering a product or who is presenting a product. And this um, kind of impulse um, uh, uh, purchases yeah. is, is an increasing number in, in, in nearly every um, industry that is driving e-commerce. So are you referring to like short form content on YouTube or other platforms where, whereby you Get and get the gist of things within a couple of seconds, like by scrolling. But but very often I, I see something on on Instagram or on Facebook. Yeah. I, I would not have the idea that I need this, um, but then I'm I'm so convinced that I want to buy this. And we also know that there are um, target groups, audiences on on these platforms that will never install an app from AutoDE, from, from Douglas, from, from whoever, but they, they are open to buy this stuff on a social media platform. Yeah, absolutely. Because, I mean, inevitably, many people are in these walled gardens and they don't necessarily want to step out of this comfort zone because it's just this is where they have their contacts that they trust. This is where they follow their favorite brands. Um, and then all of a sudden, I think it's not so typical to go to unless you're a really loyal customer to go to one particular brand with a with a separate and, app and we call this discovery commerce because yeah. uh, people people are um are seeing a product they they are interacting with the ad or with the video yeah. and then immediately they are convinced that this is a, a great pro product to buy and if you are offering this seamless way to buy a product, people will buy. Yeah. Talking about influence, um, what do you think of, of the development of live shopping in Germany right now? Especially when we're talking about the fashion industry. Uh, this is among uh, the few very important trends, I believe, whereby you really get it, where people take the time and listen to their favorite influencers and like uh, talking about sustainability and all these other uh, people want to really know what's behind the product that it's not just like it's not enough to just take a look at it um, from the product description they want to get to the bottom of it sometimes you know what I mean so how do you see live shopping in uh, Germany in Germany particularly we are early in the beginning of uh, of this trend so we we saw experiments uh, um, all over the the ecom place um, Zalando is doing this auto de is doing this for sure about you Douglas um, media Markt uh, did sim something similar and, even Hofner, uh, like yeah. and uh, and what what we what we see is Everybody started this inspired by APEC. Uh, we see in Asia um, how people are buying stuff uh, online or mobile via live shopping. And uh, uh, not to forget um, with the Q4 
see uh, with the um, home shopping 24, we have uh, a legacy. Of the past. Yeah, we have a legacy of, yeah. of live shopping. And this is a, a new way um, of uh, selling stuff. Um, and I expect particularly fashion items and products that are not that easy to understand how to use, yeah. um, are not super self-explaining. These are the categories and, and uh, um, beauty products for sure. Absolutely. Uh, these are the categories that will um, see kind of a renaissance um, when it comes to live shopping and uh, I expect way more um, uh, development in this area over the next years. So for the moment, we still have um, these projects driven by, by brand departments and I expect this becomes a proper sales channel in the future. Yeah, definitely. And you see these brands being aware of this trend, which started four or five years ago, maybe five years ago, um, has its roots in China and some other markets in Asia, and then now expanding to the European markets. And uh, you've, you've mentioned a couple of examples like Douglas, and um, the, I've also seen some feeds from Chibo, for example. Very interesting because like coffee is typically also something that people really delve into. People become fan of coffee and they, they want to like find out more and more. Um, just they want to get a certain machine and like have this experience, right? It's not something that you just like watch something and you're done. Um, that's interesting. And at the same time, uh, you see the, the most in interesting part of live shopping for online advertisers, online mar marketers is that you see increase in conversion rates up to 40%. This is, um, but interestingly, Douglas did a test and some others whereby they had like first and foremost, they, they had some interesting looking, uh, beautiful looking uh, models that, that did some feeds. But then again, the consumer show has shown during these tests that they really like product experts. After a while, you have product experts in the example of Chiba also that really tell you the entire story. What is behind this product? And, and, I mean, this is, this is, this is a testament um, for the development that nearly all of our clients are trying to, to find ways um, into the um, mid-funnel area. Yeah. So, and here we need to find answers how scalable these approaches are. How scalable will live shopping be at some point? I mean, it's easy to have uh, a product catalog with 100,000 products and uh, one uh, a dynamic ad on, on Instagram or on, on, on Facebook and sell stuff. But uh, if you cons consider live shopping as more part of the consideration phase, where we need to convince people with arguments and with, uh, with uh, specific offerings, then th that's a challenge of, of scalability and we need to find answers for this. And if we, if we um, will be able to make a live shopping scalable, then, then this, this is uh, something that, that drives sales. Uh, um. To sum up, I think there's also the component of fear of missing out that is used by many companies, right? So um, typically you have a deal 20, 30% off just for that one hour in the week so that you take the time and attend this feed and you don't want to miss that uh, great deal, right? So good sales techniques never gets old. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think um, that's at least what I've observed to be the case for many, many um offers of live shopping until now, right? And besides beside the live shopping um, thing, um, this is kind of a new, new reinvented uh, sales strategy, but our advertisers are also um, diving deeper into new technologies. So they are looking for, for ways how to adapt uh, augmented reality, how to adapt virtual reality. Because um, imagine if you, if you have an kind of an avatar with your um, body uh, uh, measures, so you can immediately wear uh, whatever you want to buy and you can see how it fits to you and then you can buy. Yeah. Imagine what, what this means for return rates. Imagine what it, what it means for, 
for um, the frequency of uh, of bias in metamorph this could mean um, for the for the basket values when you yeah. think about uh, this from a perspective from a, from an advertiser many people are also of course they want to buy a product that fits them and they will have to return the products if they don't fit right but there someone asks uh, of course one asks himself or herself there has to be a smarter solution which um, is probably a good segue if you could tell us a little bit about the metaverse. I mean, what is your definition working in your um, capacity at Meta? So what, what is your definition of metaverse? I would say the metaverse is, um, is the next evolution of the mobile internet. So what, what we, what we um, see is a development not initiated by, by Meta. It's, uh, it's something a lot of major companies are working on. And that's the idea to create um, a space where we will be able to, to get way more immersive experience than ever before. Yeah. Um, the metaverse is something that is driven by presence. I can be close to you with my avatar, as an example, even if you are in Australia and I'm in, in South America. It's also driven by um, continuity. So um, you can transfer whatever you have in the metaverse to another spot, to another world, to, to another um, device. And it's also driven by interoperability. So we, we need to find ways to connect everything that's available. This means hardware, this means um, apps, this means experiences, um, everything needs to be connected. So, and um, what, we, what we always say, the metaverse is nothing that um, will affect our business today. What we can see or what we expect is uh, um, the metaverse will something that is relevant for businesses in five to 10 years. But we also can see glimpses how the metaverse will look like. Look at Roblox, look at Fortnite, look at our Quest devices. So you, you will get an idea what it means to act in the metaverse and how the metaverse as a concept can change the way how we are doing business in the future. I mean, in certain ways, someone could challenge you and say, yeah, but we had all this 20 years ago with Second Life. How would you answer that? It was long, long, long ago. And uh, as once far, upon a time, as, as far as I remember, when I heard the first time from Second Life, uh, my first reaction was, who needs something like this? So when I heard the first time about the metaverse, my first reaction was, who needs this? So, but um, if you, if you dive a bit deeper, you, you see um, Second Life was centralized infrastructure, purely web-based. Uh, when we think about the metaverse, um, it's more about um, a connection of different devices. Devices that even not exist at the moment. Um, and uh, it's, uh, it's more about the, the experiences we, we will have in the future. And uh, as I'm a bit older than most of the people who are watching this episode, um, I was part of the, of the team in the telecommunication industry that tried to bring iMode as a mobile internet service to Europe. And it completely failed. It was mobile internet based on a web portal with fancy icons and uh, um, some links uh, to, to more content it was a created offer and it failed because there was no additional benefit in this new mobile web. And only when, when, when um, the iPhone and the, not only the device, but, but the app ecosystem around us, then there was a need for mobile internet. And then everybody um, understood why the mobile internet is different to the to the web to the desktop internet 
and why this is progress and why this offers additional opportunities for users but also for businesses. And we will see the same on the metaverse. And uh, the metaverse is something that is not just created by one company like Meta. This is an idea a lot of other companies are working on. Yeah. Microsoft is working on, on solutions. I mentioned Fortnite, I mentioned Roblox. A lot of other companies are working on solutions for this idea called Metaverse. As a matter of fact, when the first iPhone came out, there has been also critics. Um, hey, this touch, uh, a cell phone needs um, a keyboard to be able to type and all these things, but um, inevitably it didn't really stick, right? So we see that all of us are using touch, um, touch devices and this is the standard today. It's, um, but in a way, I think it's like comparable to climate change because many businesses don't see the immediate, like when they look outside, they don't see metaverse, like people walking around with VR gadgets. Uh, so they, they might think this is far in the future. Maybe it's just a fad, not a trend, like long lasting trend. Um, so I guess this brings us to the point. What do you think? Like, what are, what are the steps? that I have to take as a user to be on the metaverse? And also what are the steps that I have to take to be present as a merchant? Like, can I um, just create an avatar and start uh, hop on a jet ski with Mark Zuckerberg? Uh, just, you know what I mean? Maybe, like, maybe, theoretically maybe, speaking. Maybe, maybe, maybe. <laughs> so first of all, um, there won't be a day when we, when we awake in the morning and say, oh no, we arrived in the metaverse. So this, this is a long, long process. So, if you want, um, by using smartwatches, by using smart glasses, by using different devices, you, you already took a step into the metaverse because all these devices are somehow connected. So, um, if you, if you try, um, one of our Oculus, um, goggles, then you, you will have an idea what uh, virtual reality could mean. And virtual reality will be part of the metaverse in the future, at least for the, for the presence component. So, but when I say um, the metaverse will be the e next evolution of mobile internet and compare this to, to um, recent uh, Quest devices that are purely in mobile because you are fixed at your seat or at the area um, where you are because uh, it's not so easy to move. So we, we will have um, mixed reality um, uh, 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 devices in the future and uh, this will be the first step. But you can do um, create your own avatar, use this in um, horizon world, you can use uh, your avatar in your uh, daily conversation with uh, via messenger, via, via WhatsApp. You can um, build augmented reality. You can create filters uh, to, to um, offer lipsticks as an example, to make sure everybody can try a lipstick uh, and can see how this color f matches to, to my, to my, uh, to the skin tone. Yeah. And, uh, um, this will, this will happen over time. Um, but from a business perspective, the most important thing is ask yourself, what do I want to do in the metaverse? What will be my purpose in the metaverse? And what can I do differently in the metaverse than I do today? So are there virtual goods? Are there digital goods I can offer or I can, are there, are there um, a virtual uh, experience or more immersive experiences that help me to drive my business? When I own a fitness studio, what about offering, um, virtual fitness courses for people who are not able to come to the fitness studio. When I'm a travel agency, what about offering um, guided tours 
um, to places normal people never will, will get to, to the Himalaya or somewhere else. When I'm a fa fashion industry, what about um, creating digital goods, digital sneakers or digital versions of, of sneakers and then selling digital stuff for the avatars but sending a physical good, a physical pair of sneakers um, to the owner of this avatar. Yeah. What, what kind of combination? So we're talking about two tracks here. One, one is everything that you kind of experience, these immersive experiences within the metaverse. And on the other hand, it could be an enhancement of your physical experience. So let's say um, we've talked about uh, return rates. We've talked about all these things that are currently blockers or challenges for retailers. And in that the metaverse could be one, uh, a platform of solution for these people. Yeah, and then, but, but talking about taking a step back again, all all this is quite exciting. But um, I'm I'm just thinking, an average merchant right now typically doesn't really know where to start with the metaverse. Like what, you've talked about the strategy that they need to develop. What do I want to do? Uh, but the, I think that's pretty much the question. What would you recommend? Like, where should they start informing themselves and how, how can they tap into this whole thing? Because you've talked about five to 10 years. I think even five years is very ambitious as a goal that you could see as some sort of mass market adoption. Um, it's just my personal opinion. Absolutely. Absolutely. But um, what business can do is uh, try to, to um, experiment with immersive experiences. Um, you can do this on our platforms and other platforms as well. Um, you, you need to, to think about um, concepts like blockchain. You need to think about um, concepts of NFTs and digital goods. Um, these are essential components for a future in the metaverse. Nobody knows today how these, how these will fit together. But this will be um, an important part of, of uh, the way how we will do business in the future. And uh, to be honest, to really understand the concept of a blockchain takes a while. So you, you need to find a way um, to understand how you can use this for your own business. And there, there will be millions of different answers on, on this question because we have millions of different businesses. Michael. It's been so inspiring to listen to your thoughts and uh, to, thanks for taking the time to tell us a little bit about your meta strategy. Um, we've touched upon the fashion industry, the challenges that they have. We've talked about cookie-less um, ma marketing and uh, advertising. We've touched upon metaverse. I think it's been a great conversation and um, very happy to have had you here. Thanks a lot. Thank you for having me. For the pleasure.